My name is Dylan Robinson. I'm the Canada Research Chair of Indigenous Arts at Queen's University, uh, a researcher focusing on Indigenous music. I'm Stalo I'm on my mother's side of the family from the West Coast, uh, just outside of Vancouver. Stalo territory runs along the Fraser River, for those of you that know that part of the country from about Fort Langley all the way up to Yale. We have 26 different communities, and my community is Matsqui and Squaw. So we're going to introduce ourselves briefly here before we get things going. So I will pass it on to my illustrious panel mates here. Hello, everybody. My name is Lhasa Dunkwa. And uh, usually sometimes when I, when I introduce myself, I like to translate what my name actually means. So Lhasa Dunkwa is a, a lot of times for the Haudenosaunee society or people, um, whenever we give, we are giving a name, uh, sometimes it has a backstory or a birth story. And uh, for me, my birth story, my name was actually given to me by my grandmother. So Lhasa Dunkwa, it translates to he who is in a hurry. So the story behind this is when I was born, the entire process of, uh, of me being born lasted two hours on the second. So I guess I was in a hurry to get here. <laughs> so uh, yes, and also I, I'm Wolf Clan. I am from the Akwazas Mohawk territory, which is about an hour east from here, alongside the, the New York and Quebec border. Um, <coughs> I said I'm Wolf Clan. I'm 20 years old. Uh, right now I'm going to school at Algonquin College for HVAC. Um, and I'm happy to be here. We've got Sununi. Now, thank you. It yep. sounds different it's, than uh, it's spelled. It's, 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 it's spelled in the Mohawk language. And the Mohawk language, uh, La Sadunkwa. Dance Cheryl Rondel and Sia Gasson. Apitoko Sanskwe on Nioma. Nehi o square go Mr. Kosuin o square. Uh, Alberta, uh, Amiskwachi was Kaigan, Eguapapas, Jace Ostinia, Maga, uh, Toronto, Miguach, New Egan. Um, Miko Piso square Egua, Osa, Mr. Tem, Neguemi. So, hello everyone. I'm Cheryl Larondel, and uh, I'm a half breed uh, from uh, northern Alberta, uh, where the city of Edmonton now sits. It's uh, we call it Meskwachi Waskaigan, which is the um, Beaver Lodge, Beaver Hills Lodge. Um, so I would have been a Beaver Hills Lodge Cree before uh, colonization. Uh, that's how we would have identified ourselves. Um, uh, the reserve I'm from is Papas Jace, uh, which means woodpecker. And um, as you know, La Rondel, those of you who speak French, it's the swallow. So as you can tell, birds figure quite, quite a lot in my family. I'm, um, I'm currently doing a PhD at the University College of Dublin, um, looking at, uh, uh, well, I'll talk about what I'm looking at in my PhD a little bit when I'm speaking later. Um, I'm a singer-songwriter and uh, also an interdisciplinary artist, and I'm really honored to be here. I'm really happy to be sitting with these uh, two amazing um, beings. Hi, hi. Can I ask something? Thank you both so much for sharing a little bit about who you who you are, and and uh, we will we will expand upon who we are further as we discuss this issue today. This this question of what are indigenous songs, <laughs> and so one of the reasons that um, I proposed to Catherine that we focus this session today on this question of what what are indigenous songs or what do indigenous songs do is because, as Daniel mentioned very first thing today, there is such great diversity across our nations and our communities uh, that we think very differently about what our songs, how they function, um, what, they, what they act as, uh, what are the protocols for the appropriate sharing of song, how that changes depending on the time of year, uh, the people who are in attendance, uh, all of these things are shifting from place to place across Canada, which makes it sometimes challenging for, for those who don't understand those protocols and those histories to 
to understand or even to feel open to approaching sometimes and being in conversation because the, the, that knowledge is so different uh, from place to place. So I mentioned this to Catherine and, and basically said I think it would be a good idea for us to share a little bit more about from different perspectives here what our songs do uh, both um, as a way of sharing that knowledge, but also as a way to start to address this larger question that came up this morning, a couple of questions around appropriation, and we'll be obviously be moving towards a very specific, specific example of that in the following session on Louis Riel. But this will give a bit of a, a chance to say, um, you know, for us to, to share with you how we understand our songs from our own uh, Indigenous perspectives, uh, how they function, and what they serve as, because of course, and I'll start off by saying, our songs quite often have life. I mean, we, we can talk about them being uh, beautiful things and moving and flowing and, and be very, in the way that we describe the songs, we can think about life, but, but in many cases, as we, as Pacific Northwest First Peoples understands our songs, understand our songs, they are living, they are living things. So there we, right off the bat, have a very different understanding of a Western, the Western conception of song being, um, you know, a beautiful thing, but not necessarily a living thing in terms of, um, you know, uh, animate thing. And a Pacific Northwest First Nations perspective of, of our songs having that life. And so I mentioned that as a way of saying, um, when, we, when we shift this foundation of understanding what songs are, we then also shift the question of what it means to misuse a song. Because if a song is living, if a song has life, then to work with that song as a composer, to present that song as an organization, to be in relationship with it, has a different set of terms, has a different kind of ethics involved in it. Um, because as we would have uh, a relationship with another person, with another living thing, you know, rather than an object. So that's just one foundation, but I want to get more specifically into discussing this um, from our, our different perspectives here. So we're each going to take about 10 minutes and, uh, and just share with you what songs are from our, our various perspectives. Following that, we'll have a conversation between the three of us, bringing up some of the ideas uh, to share between among ourselves of, of what, we've, what we've shared with you. And then following that, leave an ample amount of time for your questions so that we can also uh, think together about, uh, about these, these issues and uh, questions that we raise. So, one of the ways I like to often begin, and some of you in the room will have seen me present this part before, uh, begin talking about songs is through a court case. And uh, the court case is a, began in the BC Supreme Court called Damaguch versus the Queen. And it was a court case around land title. The Wet'suwet'en and Gitsan people uh, had a land claim that they uh, were, were putting forward to the courts. And during that, during those proceedings, the judge, Justice McEachern, said to uh, one of the plaintiffs, Mary Johnson, said, well, okay, I'd like you now to demonstrate your evidence to your claim to these lands. How do you, how do you prove that these lands are yours? And Mary Johnson very simply said, oh, that's easy, I'll sing you a song. And the the judge said, well, I'm, I'm sorry, you know, this is a court of law. You, you can't sing a song here. That, that's not going to do you, good, you know, any good. He said, I have a tin ear. I'm not going to be able to hear your song. And so I'm going to read you just a bit of this uh, excerpt from the court case here to give you an example of how this proceeded. So the plaintiff's counsel, Mr. Grant, was trying to convince the judge at this point why it was necessary to sing the song. And he says, the song is part of the history, and I'm asking the witness to sing the song as part of the history, because I think in the song itself invokes the history of the, of the particular adauch to which she is referring. Adauch is uh, uh, history, the, the, sort of the Gitsan equivalent word for history here, or protocol in history. McEachern says, how long is it? How long is the song? Grant says, it's not very long, it's very short. McEachern then says, could it not be written out and asked if this was if this is the wording. Really, we are on the verge of getting way off track here, Mr. Grant. Again, I don't want to be, be skeptical, but to have to witness singing songs in court is, in my respectful view, not the proper way to approach this problem. 
and then says, my lord, Mr. Jackson will make submission a submission to you with respect. He cuts McKechnie and cuts him off by saying, no, no, that isn't necessary. If this has to be done, if you say as counsel this has to be done, I'm going to listen to it. I just say, with respect, I've never heard it happen before. I never thought it necessary, and I don't think it necessary now. But I'll be glad to hear what the witness says if you say this is what she has to do. It doesn't seem to me she has to sing it. Grant then says, well, my lord, with respect, the song is, is what one may refer to as a death song. It's a song which itself invokes the history and the depth of the history of what she is telling. And as counsel, it is in my submission that it is necessary for you to appreciate. And McEachin then cuts him off by saying, I have a tin ear, Mr. Grant, so it's not going to do any good for you to sing it to me, for her to sing it to me. So this is a representation here. There was a, um, a person in the court who documented all of this through drawing uh, that was part of the local newspaper. The title here, because it's pretty small, is The Law versus Ayuk, Written versus Oral History. And you have on the left-hand side there the Western equivalent, the Western history represented by thick law tomes and maps. And on the right-hand side, you have Mary Johnson singing the song. Uh, what I love is that it's rising above those Western forms of evidence. But this is really a good depiction here because it, it shows these two being of equal importance, um, the, sort of the Gitsan version of evidence here of, the, of, the, of their claim to the land and the Western. McEachern went on to say, Mr. Grant, would you explain to me, because this may happen again, why you think it was necessary to sing this, the song? This is a trial, not a performance. It's not necessary in a matter of this kind for that song to have been sung, and I think that I must say now that I ought not to have been exposed to it. I don't think it should happen again. I think I'm being imposed upon, and I don't think that should happen in a trial like this. So... Uh, here we have a second uh, cartoon that shows Mary Johnson at the top saying, I could sing that song for you folks, but this court doesn't like me to sing. And at the bottom, we have Justice McEachern uh, saying, I can't hear your Indian song. This is Johnson, I've got a tin ear. And that's Mary Johnson's hand on the other side saying, that's okay, your highness, I've got a can opener. <laughs> <laughs> so the question here is how do we think about different forms of song, different functions of song as law, as medicine, as historical documentation, and the way that we might be able to begin to hear those? How do we think about getting rid of the tin ears that don't allow us to hear um, these song as these things? And Walt Taylor, I think he was one, another person in the courtroom, a non-Indigenous uh, person, who said, I think put it really well, he said, the cartoon shows Chief Johnson using her can opener to overcome the cross-cultural deafness caused by the judicial tin ear. Most of us non-Aboriginal Canadians also wear a tin ear. It seems natural because we have worn it all our lives. We are not even aware of the significant sound we cannot hear." End quote. So here we have an instance of song acting as law. Okay, and I, I bring this up just to show you the the equivalency, as I said before, of of how many Pacific Northwest Coast songs demonstrate that uh, that tie to our history of of the territories that we are from. Uh, but this is one of many forms of song uh, of what song acts as, as it also acts as medicine for our people. It acts as uh, personal family history. We have a very personal connection and and I bring these things up to complex make more complex this discussion of appropriation because as I said before if we think of these things as not just song then we also need to ask what happens when a composer uses these uh, these living things these laws these forms of medicine uh, in a composition um, and then follow through in redressing the misuse in those ways, not just through copyright, not just through a legal framework of what do we do now? How do we, through a, a Western legal perspective, treat the fact that these songs have been used uh, inappropriately um, from that one perspective? But we need to think about the larger form of redress that we must follow through on uh, to then think through the damages that have been done in those other areas for misusing medicine, for misusing uh, history, personal history, or for um, you know, 
taking a, uh, you could say, even a violent approach. In our second conversation around Louis Riel, I'll bring up some instances here of how Niska people heard their song in this opera uh, as a very violent action. So how do we, how do we move beyond that in treating the, the misuse of our songs? And how do we also consider these things, uh, open these up as possibilities? These are not just negative instances, but we could also offer this uh, to various indigenous participants in the creative practices that we um, help along the way. So w what if we start thinking about songs with orchestras as a form of treaty making? What if we start thinking about uh, songs that are uh, in collaboration with orchestras as forms of medicine? There are real possibilities here for thinking um, much more broadly about the potential, not just the negative consequences from issues of appropriation, but how might we expand our imaginations to, to move into indigenous epistemologies, indigenous understandings of what song acts as. So I'll just close my portion of this presentation today by saying, again, these are all very uh, individual instances. We can't say consistently, it would be impossible to say every form of Indigenous song is medicine or law or has life. They are all individual. Uh, there are many instances of Indigenous contemporary songs where uh, performers and composers would say, no, they are none of those things. That's just a song. <laughs> so, so we also need to be very specific here. Uh, but I raise this context because it's not the, the context I think that many people normally think of when they consider what Indigenous songs are. Yes, so at the, at the first level, the BC Supreme Court, um, it was not a successful uh, trial because a lot of the oral evidence was not um, uh, deemed actual, like legitimate evidence, and then it was taken to the uh, Supreme Court of Canada, where it had a, a positive uh, outcome. I, I mean, generally, this is treated as a case that is of importance because of the way it set precedents for demonstrating Indigenous legal uh, traditions through orality and through song. So I like to frame it that way rather than simply, you know, the, the outcome. Thank you. So. The topic today is perspective of cultural songs. Uh, for me, the Haudenosaunee, or I'm Ganyankahaga, which is the Mohawk Nation of um, the Iroquois Confederacy. So my perspective of songs comes from when I was very young. Growing up, I went to uh, what we call the Akwazasne Freedom School, which is a fully Mohawk immersion Mohawk school for um, so going there I've learned my traditions my my ceremonial songs everything about my culture from kindergarten to eighth grade so everything I know about songs comes from that place the Akwazasne Freedom School and my perspective of it is that there is different types of categories within the Mohawk nations of songs that we have and the two most, the two that I can talk about today are the social songs and the ceremonial songs. I'm mo mostly going to talk about the, the social songs. Most part is that why we have social songs is the main purpose is a gathering of people. It's they're celebratory songs. Sometimes they're a celebratory of life and sometimes they're a celebratory of death. Um, there are, there are some songs that I could actually demonstrate uh, in, a, in a few minutes. But growing up, uh, having, having cultural songs in, in my uprising, it really helped me find my voice. It really defined who I was as a person. It helped me, it helped me get into my culture much easier. Because growing up, it's, it was like, there was two paths laid in front of me. There was staying traditional or going off the path and leaving it behind. And it's so easy to do. Dylan was talking about how there are certain songs that we need to forget and certain songs that, that come up whenever we need them. Um, last year, I actually lost a good friend of mine and so whenever we do, whenever we lose family members, 
we bring out our what we call our death songs. But we don't ever think about these songs until that person has passed away. And for the 10 day period, that's the only songs that we sing is to help bring that person to the other side. What I wanted to go over was more of um, the social songs, such as one that we have, which is called uh, the Passenger Pigeon Dance. And actually, could you have me? You gotta do it. Yeah, <laughs> you gotta do it. <laughs> I gotta do it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so there are a few instruments that the Haudenosaunee have for for social songs. I've uh, brought a couple. We have what we call the water drum or the ganat joey. And this drum goes back thousands and thousands of years. Not this one in particular, but uh, the idea of it. And we also have our rattles. Uh, these style of rattles, this is a more modern, modern type. Um, the more ancient ones we use were mainly uh, birch bark and um, what we call yo-yo seeds. And, um, but in this one, um, so I'm getting, I'm getting off track, but um, the Passenger Pigeon Dance, it was a song made in memoriam for the Passenger Pigeon, which I believe was the late 50s to early 60s is when they gone extinct. And for the Haudenosaunee people, it was one of the main, it had a very big effect on our people because it was much like how we would hunt ducks and geese today. It was a big source of some food. A source of food. Whenever the crops weren't doing as well, they were. We always resorted to the passenger pigeon. And uh, before I get into that, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, the Gunat Joey and how the ideas of it. So growing up, I've always been told that the Gunat Joey represents our grandmother. So we treat it as such as you would treat your grandmother. You know we. If you drop it on the floor, you have to say you're sorry, or else it's it's not good, you know. <laughs> or else your actual grandmother might give you a smack or something. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> but another way we looked at it was that it wasn't just your grandmother. It was also looked as this is creation. Because what it's comprised of is wood from the earth water that is inside, I don't know if you can hear that, sorry, mm -hmm. and um, leather, which came from deer hide. So those three, so we have sustenance, earth, and water, and also the air that it, that's inside here. So with these three elements came about uh, our, our ceremonial songs, which go back thousands and thousands of years. And that's one of the reasons that we have oral tradition is because these songs, whenever they get passed down, it's much like how we have our wampum belts. Our wampum belts, they, they write the history. They're there to remember a certain event or a certain treaty or a certain whatever the case may be. And with, with our songs, it was meant as to kind of expand on certain events or certain ways of living. Um, so, this is the Ganat Joey, and we call this the Gastoa, or Ostawa, I'm mean, sorry. And um, our actual word for song or singing is Galana. And that, that stem word for Galana actually means, it means prayer. So, a lot of our basis of our songs, whenever we're singing, it's like we're praying, but we also are we have a different type of thinking. So whenever we do a ceremony, we usually open up, open up the room with uh, the opening address or a Thanksgiving address. And different parts or different people think of the opening address as like a morning prayer. But to us, it's more of just an acknowledgement of creation and of everything that helps us in our lives. And that goes all the way back. It ties along with uh, our drum. So I wanted to get back to the Passenger Pigeon Dance. It's a song that it's supposed to make us remember that 
that that pigeon that it's sacrificed it wasn't forgotten that it was a song of gratitude and a song that we will never forget and the song has been it's one of our newer songs because of the passenger pigeon a lot of our songs are thousands of years old and this is one of the newer versions <clears throat> Ayo ajine yo ajine Ayo ajine yo ajine Ayo ajine yo ajine Awe ni yo Ayo wajine yo wajine Ayo wajine yo wajine Awe ni yo Awe ni yo Awe ni yo Awe ni yo Aine yo Awe ni yo Awe ni yo Aine Ayo wajine yo wajine <laughs> Now um so yeah this is that was the passenger pigeon dance and this is also one of the songs that was implemented into our social song categories um a lot of the ceremonial songs I actually can't go over with too much about but um Another songs are other songs that are in the the social song category they're they're made for everybody so uh, as long as we're talking about the the topic of sharing songs and what's appropriate and what's not for the Haudenosaunee, uh the Mohawk nation in particular social songs are are always made for everybody so people actually make songs every year and we have what we call a, a sing which is which is a, a group or um, a gathering of all the nations into one nations to share what uh, to share the new social songs that they have came up oath with over the year so once a year we do this and it's to help keep up keep people up to date with what the new songs are and what can be used and what can be forgotten um, so, uh, if anyone has any questions, I would love to hear some questions. <laughs> uh, in particular, about any songs. <laughs> this is my first time on a panel, so I'm, I'm a little nervous. You're doing great. You're doing great. Yeah. 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 I'll turn it over. Okay. Okay. <laughs> and uh, I'm gonna record myself because that's always a good way to. Uh, to make sure I stay at 10 minutes because I always jokingly say that I come from a family that knows how to make a short story really long. So, <laughs> so um, um, mentioning my family, I, I come from a musical family. So, um, you know, from a very small, a very young age, uh, you know, country music had already, already been introduced into our family. And um, we were, you know, when I, by the time I was born, we were mostly city dwelling. Um, so the, the rule in my family was growing up was that um, when my Auntie Celeste was singing the lead, you had to find a harmony or some other rhythm or something else to do because she had the nicest voice. So that was kind of my, you know, my musical training really as a young child was just being amidst my relatives. And um, I think um, the thing I've realized um, as I've gone through my life and sort of um, met with other people who knew my family in the generations before, um, I started to realize that music uh, played a different role in our life. And what, what I was born into was kind of what was left. 
you know, after we had moved off of the land and had moved into um, the cities. And I was telling uh, Lassen Dongwa a little bit about was, um, you know, why I call myself a half-breed versus a Métis person. Um, and it uh, really just quickly refers to the fact that um, uh, the, Mét the Métis were, uh, um, this is from Maria Campbell, the author of uh, Half-Breed, very uh, well-known um, um, academic in our, and uh, elder in our world. She told me that there was a point in time when those who called themselves Métis were actually the ones who wanted to become part of Canadian society and wanted to become Christian and they, they let go of the matriarchy. They let go of the, the notion that there was a, an elder woman in the family, that there was medicines to be kept, um, and that you would become, um, you'd become Christian and you'd allow the nun from the parish to become that, that matriarch. And, um, and then there was the half-breeds. And the half-breeds were the ones who were like abjectly poor, lived on road allowances, but knew they were related to those Métis, those ones who decided to become French or Canadian or whatever. But you also knew you were related to your, your Indian relatives who still lived out in the bush. Um, and so that's my family where we were definitely half-breeds. And then there was the Otapimsuak, and the Otapimsuak were the ones who, uh, and that's a Cree word, it means uh, those who are free. And it was those who decided to go live out in the bush and live in small family enclaves and still hunt and trap and lead that kind of a lifestyle. So just quickly, that's that's why I call myself a half-breed. I know you called me a Métis once and I was like, huh? Huh? <laughs> it's just <laughs> not Christian. Um, so um, one thing I just want to start off with is that in Cree language, um, um, part of my research in my PhD is I'm looking at smaller language parts. I'm looking at morphemes and phonemes, you know, really wanting to break down to some of the etymology of, of some, um, some of our languages um, and looking at the relationship between the, um, those smaller language parts and land formation. Because, um, you know, um, the Cree nation or what you might call as the Cree nation is a very, very big nation that goes all the way from northern British Columbia, Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, northern Ontario, and into Quebec. So, you know, how can that be one nation? And, and we know it's not. We know that, as I mentioned in my introduction, you know, there was the, the River Cree and the Island Cree and the, you know, we were all designated by where we were from. Um, but within um, Cree language, generally, um, when you break down those language sounds, they relate very nicely to land formation. And from where I'm from, um, the word we, or the sound part, weo, means to sound, you know. So it's really interesting. You start to hear that in different words and, and you start to realize that, um, that there's some relationship to what these sound parts mean. Um, and one other thing about, well, I'm a half-breed, but I also call myself Cree, is that we, um, Cree are known as the four direction people. And so you might think it's the four cardinal directions, which wouldn't be uh, incorrect in thinking. But I had a recent teaching that I was just telling Dylan about, um, and it's about these language sounds, you know. And um, so, for instance, the sound pe in our, in our language means to move toward something is moving toward you. The sound pe in our language is something is moving across. The sound po is something is going in or getting on. And the sound pa is something is rising out of. So that's how we become the four direction people. And as we were commenting earlier, it's, it's, a, it's a really interesting dimension. It's not flat, you know? It's not linear. It's quite, it's quite full, you know? So in that world of that world of that dynamic fullness, you know, to wail, to sound, it sort of has a different connotation. It's kind of akin to maybe echolocation, you know? You can understand the acoustics of where you are. You understand where your voice is bouncing um, um, onto and off of. So um, there is in in from a Cree worldview, um, there's different or from maybe a Northern Plains worldview, there's different types of songs that we have um, in the same way. Um, we have songs that are um, for activities. We have songs that are family songs. We have songs that are ceremonial songs. We have songs that are uh, referring to atoyakan or legendary beings um, that walked a long time ago. 
And we have uh, Sukatsuwen songs, strong songs that are kind of songs about strength. So it's just a few examples. Um, you know, family songs would be something that would be within a family. You would know that song. It would be handed down. It might be a song that was about um, uh, kind of the kind of lovely motifs that your great 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 grandmother or grandfather made. You know, and when they're when they were singing their songs, and you always know, eh? You know that that song comes from that family because that's the kind of the cadence and the and the rhythm and the kind of shapes, melodic shapes. You know, very very distinct. Um, but there's also uh, probably majorly what's important is there's these activity songs. So there's songs that are for um, there's songs that are hunting. There's a sunrise song for singing in the morning. There's birthing songs. There's child rearing songs. Um, and then there's honor songs, you know. Uh, there's uh, songs to welcome visitors. You know, songs for every kind of activity you can imagine, there's these songs. And they would be different across families. You know, every family, every community would have their own songs like this, you know. Um, same thing when you go down to Aotearoa and visit the Maori and you go into a Faranui, which I've been, you know, that each Faranui has its own songs, you know. And after they sing their songs, then they look at you, visitor, and you're supposed to sing the songs that come from your place as well, you know. So that kind of reminds us the importance of those songs, you know, that we know we should know those songs and continue to have them. Um, I think one of the, from, from what I kind of have realized, is that some of the ceremonial songs from the plains are some of the songs that might be songs that you would hear more often than outside of a family home or outside of if you were hunting with some guys or outside of if you were in a birthing lodge, you know, etc. And the reason that those ceremonial songs might be heard more is that, as Ramses can attest, uh, he should be up on this panel here, but it, I'll just point to you every now and again. Um, you know, when you go to different ceremonies, you will hear songs over and over. You'll hear them regularly at different ceremonies. Um, but the thing, important thing to realize is that those songs should never be confused with popular songs. They're not songs meant for commodification. They're not songs meant to be recorded or notated. Those are songs that even in some parts of the world, as I've learned being in Dylan's territory, if you're not from that family, don't even bother humming along. It's not your song to sing, you know? And I was telling Dylan of an experience when I went to a potlatch on the West Coast where I was instructed, because I pick up songs really fast, and I was instructed not to sing anyone's songs. So it was a really beautiful exercise for 15 hours to just do count, count time signatures. That's all I did, just counted time signatures. And it was a beautiful learning just in that way. That was a beautiful experience. Um, I think, um, so the ceremonial songs would have been heard and get, and get heard by people. And you might at some point be given the right to sing that song. You might at some point be gifted with that song. From our worldview, it would mostly happen by if you had a dream. If you had a dream that you were doing an activity, you would go visit somebody and they would instruct you where to go and visit. And if you followed that, if you followed that dream and you followed those instructions, you might find that you were given the right to, to carry a song. Um, and you might be given the right to carry a song for a period of time, even in the way that some of these archives uh, recordings are meant to go back to the family. You know, there might be a point in time where you, you know, you realize, oh, I need to give this now to this family member. You know, I've carried it for that long. Um, and then the other types of songs that we're more familiar with now is uh, everyone's familiar with powwow songs. And where I'm from, um, which is the round dance, which is a northern, uh, northern Cree style. Um, same thing. Those songs are being recorded. Um, and so everyone knows those songs. And you can go to a powwow and you'll sing along to those songs. But what's um, my understanding, and I'm, I'm going to cite Joseph Neitauhau here, who told me this, was um, he's um, a Cree knowledge keeper and elder from northern Saskatchewan. And he told me one time that when powwow first came in, when it first entered Cree communities in Saskatchewan, it was a woman, a, a Cree woman, who had spent time down in Lakota territory. 
and um, they and they had taught her a dance. They taught her one of their dances. So she came home very excitedly, and they gifted her with it. So you have the right to do this dance now. So she came home and she showed everybody that dance, and they were like, "Oh, wow, that's a beautiful dance!" You know, we didn't have that dance. We had our win, We had our other dances, you know, and uh, you know it started to spread. You know, that's how it kind of spread was the Lakota and Dakota Dakota people started to share, you know, their their social form, you know, and that's what we know today as powwow. Um, but the thing that's really important that I've learned, and I'm over time, but I'll, I'll wrap up here, is that um, from, from what I understand is that in the same way Dylan was talking about the animacy, um, all things are animate. All things are beings. All objects are beings. And it's why we would call them our belongings as opposed to, oh, it's just, it's just that drum, it's just that thing. It's a belonging, you know? There's a relationship that we forge. So in that same way, if everything is animate and everything is a belonging and everything is a being, everything, every being also has its own song. So every plant has its own song, every tree has its own song, every animal has its own song, every land formation has its own song, every belonging that we love and we carry on our journey with us, it has its own song. So um, I think one of the challenging things um, I'll finish off with is that the challenge then is, is um, with regards to what I've told you about ceremonial songs being maybe the closest thing to a popular song within an indigenous framework is that you can't you can't notate it and you can't record it and it can't become like the contemporary Canadian or world notion of what popular songs are. There has to be a different treatment of it and a different understanding. You have to earn these. You have to earn them and you have to carry them and you have to care for them and you have to love them. And when the time is right, you need to either stop listening to them, stop hearing them, or pass them on. So I'll just finish with that, maybe. Jose. Thank you. Thank you both. So we wanted to have a little bit of a chance for conversation between the three of us here, um, just to toss some ideas around a little bit for just, so maybe we'll do that for 10, 15 minutes or so, and then leave a large amount of time for questions for, from the audience. Do you guys mind if I record what we're doing? No, okay. it's fine. I'll, I'll give you each a copy yeah. of it if you want. Yeah. yeah. Um, and maybe I'll just start off by saying one of the things that's really interesting to me is that the opportunity to for us to come together, for Indigenous people from across Canada or from even across the globe to come together to discuss our songs, artistic practices, histories even, um, feels to me relatively new in a consistent way to do it consistently. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we don't. Uh, it's a. It's a. The land is far and wide. It's large, right? It's hard to actually uh, just simply get to see each other. Uh, there, are, there's time and resources involved in that. But I say this also because I have come to realize that the, um, you know, that I was never given an education about indigenous histories and protocols and uh, cultural practices across these lands. I, I know very, very little about Mohawk, Cree, uh, Maliseet, uh, the, the kind of the breadth and range of our practices and protocols because I was never taught them you know, in, in primary school or <coughs> secondary or post-secondary for that matter. And so it's what I find is, is, is interesting right now is that we're coming together quite a bit more frequently and, and we're coming into productive dialogue a lot of the time around what are our different practices and protocols for, for singing and sharing song, uh, how we understand what our songs are, and also having some challenges around doing that, some questions around how do we come together in ways where our different protocols um, are interwoven or in relationship rather than at odds. 
And Cheryl and I were talking just, just very briefly before, I'm sure some of you in the room have heard about the, the Indigenous Music Awards and the question around the, I'm sorry, I forget the name of the um, uh, Cree singer right now. I don't now. remember her name either, yeah. Sorry about that. You... Uh, singing, uh, uh, singing throat, throat singing. Mm -hmm. And then the Inuit community saying, well, stop, cease and desist. This is not your song to share in this way. And the follow-up from the Indigenous Music uh, Association was, well, we, you know, we, um, I'm again forgetting the details here, but we understand that creator says that music is for everyone. And the Inuit response was, well, who's this creator? <laughs> right? So just to sort of put these things in, in tension here to say that these are very, we have very, very different understandings of um, how we consider the shareability of our music, the way that we can take these practices up uh, between ourselves and between mm -hmm. our nations. That's really important for us to, to do right now. Um, and I hope, you know, I, I hope that, uh, that that sort of puts this on a different level for people thinking about we're all doing this together. It's not just, you know, we, we don't have our relationships all figured out entirely <laughs> sometimes either. But I, I wanted to just sort of open that up and Cheryl and... Uh, yeah. uh, I think, I think yeah. media would be a, like a good way to connect, mm -hmm. connect us. Um, I know that when we do, when we do like a social... Um, it really brings everybody together and it's a way to it's a way to share uh, what can be shared and it's also a good place to talk about where uh, what we can and can't share mm -hmm. um, and I think it's a good I good idea to start getting what we can share onto the media and have a better have a better understanding for people mm -hmm. to uh, to get their hands on or to have a better understanding. And you, you were talking yeah. about that uh, sort of the yearly gathering to yes. discuss yes. new yeah. new songs, right? That yes, I mean. the uh, well, we we call it a sing. Uh, it goes from a different um, different nation each year, so it's always in a different. Every year it goes to a different nation. Usually it's random. Um, I think every four years it'll come to Akwazasne, so uh, I think we're, I think next year it'll be in Akwazasne. Mm -hmm. um, well, yeah, uh, every time we have our sings, we go there and we we record all the songs from different nations, different groups. Uh, I was actually in a group a couple years ago when uh, each each group brings up five new songs. If it's not the five new songs of uh, the women's dance. In particular, everyone shares a new version of a woman's dance, uh, or we call it "degashit uh, degalanyos," or um, it translates to the shuffling of the feet. Mm -hmm. So whenever we, yeah, whenever we, whenever the women uh, dance for these women, women dance songs, they shuffle their feet along as it goes all the way back to the creation story of mm. how um, Sky Woman, when she fell um, down to the earth and she was on the this great sea turtle's back. All she had in, was um, seeds from the sky world and a little bit of dirt from the bottom of the ocean. And how she spread that, she used her feet and went along the side of the turtle. And, and that's how she was managed to survive. And that grew and grew and grew until we have what we know as Mother Earth. Mm -hmm. And that's the, that's the yeah. Kanyangkeha version of uh, our creation story. It's a very much... That's very broad or um, summarized version of it. <laughs> <laughs> I could sit here and talk for days about the creation story, but I'm yeah. trying to keep it yeah. pretty short. Well, we were talking, I think, the, about this, mm -hmm. the issue of the uh, Cree woman. Um, and I'm sorry, I, I don't know her and I don't, can't remember her name, but I did. Yes, Sequest, yeah. And um, I've been sitting back and just um, experiencing this whole story because I mean, there was a point in time when I was recording more and trying to be and trying to gig more and you know be part of the contemporary indigenous music thing. But I'm kind of getting too old for it and decided to do a PhD instead. But so I've been kind of like sitting back and listening to this whole what's going on. And I said to Dylan, what I think what I think is quite interesting, and maybe we can chat about this, is that if you think about um, if you think about from a plains indigenous point of view, we had 
um, something that um, was called the sneak up. And the sneak up was, if you think of, don't think of Canadian law, don't think of European law, but think of the law of the natural order, which is really the only law that still exists on our land, this land. It's really the only law of the land, is the natural order, where there's a bit of a balance, there's a bit of, you know, things go out of balance, they shift the other way, you know. Um, and so I was telling Dylan that in some reserves in northern Saskatchewan, for instance, if somebody's got like a shovel or a hoe or a, something outside, leaning outside their house, and they go out the next morning and it's gone, you don't call the police. You'd go, oh, somebody needed that. That's it. Pretty simple. It's not theft. Somebody needed it, you know? So there is this notion of the sneak up that you go and you get what you need. It's pretty simple. You know, it gives you a different notion of, you know, I mean, it, if it's a cherished belonging, it's now someone else's cherished belonging and they'll probably take really good care of it, you know? If it's a really useful, like aptishigan is a Cree word for like a useful device, well, it's now somebody else's very useful device. So thinking about that and thinking about this notion of the, of the throat singing, and no way do I want anyone to walk out of this room saying, it's okay, because she said, mm -hmm. but philosophically thinking about it within the context of the sneak up. You know, this Cree woman heard this sound, you know? She acquired it and it worked with what she was doing. And the thing you need to know as well is that the Inuit and the Cree, we were, we were enemies. Just like um, where I'm from, we were also enemies with the Blackfoot. And we were also enemies with the Dene. And the Dene were also enemies with the Inuit. So we had these, and, and also I need you to not think about any enemy within French or English. Because the French or English definition of enemy is not the same definition in my language. In my language, an enemy is, uh, the word is kustagan, and it means something that you're afraid of, right? And, there's a, and that's a healthy relationship, if you think of it. You know, there's a healthy kind of like, whoa, not quite sure what they're going to, you know, they might have a trick up their sleeve today. I hope it don't scare you. No, 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 you're good. I'm, good. I'm sitting this far. I'm quite comfortable. Yeah, and same with you, you know. But the thing is, is that... We, we had those healthy relationships of you're, you're a bit afraid of them because they've got their own skills. And we had what was called, um, the French word is counting coup. Um, and that was where young men would go out and have skirmishes. And, and they wouldn't, they were enemies, but they weren't killing each other. What they would do is they'd be such a good shot that they could lean underneath their horse, pull a bow and arrow back, and just go whoosh just past your ear, just so you heard the sound of the feather, so that whale sound, Whew. and that would give you fear. Now you're scaring me. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah, yeah. You see, so, so the diff that's a different notion of what an enemy is. See, I told you about long stories. But anyways, um, to get back to this issue, you know, I mean, that's the thing that's maybe the sub-story that's not being heard is that, is that, you know, we're not all, we're, we weren't all just friends and all buddy-buddy before, you know, Europeans came. We had our territories, we had our things. And I actually think it's super healthy that the Inuit are being so adamant about it. I think it's great. I think it's like, you know, as a, as a Cree person, I'm not like mad or offended or taking sides. I'm like, it's really great to see that the Inuit are saying, there's a lot of things we'll share, you know? The Yanukshuk was part of the Vancouver Olympics, and there's a lot of things that have been taken out of context, but that's one thing you're not going to take is our throat singing. And I think it's really super healthy and important. Mm -hmm. yeah. What would have happened is that that Cree woman, if we would have lived in a, in a different world or even for herself, would have been that if she dreamt about it, if she dreamt about that sound, you know, then she mm -hmm. might have followed that journey, you know, that leg of the journey to yeah. kind of go and get the permission because mm -hmm. she heard that sound in a dream and it had a different connotation. That's what I think. Yeah. What do you think about that? Uh, I think... You can say I'm wrong. We can have a fight. <laughs> 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 um, I'm getting fearful now. It's, it's, <laughs> it's, hard, to, it's hard to go find um, the permission sometimes, if it, especially if it's coming from within and you feel <clears throat> that it's something you need to get out and something that you need to learn and if it heals you personally and it brings you good energy I can't see a way that's that that's 
anything wrong with that. <laughs> hey, I'm being very West Coast here. We're known for our protocols oh, being very yeah. sort of oh, yeah. stringent. And I, <laughs> I, I feel like my response is, is to say, well, I don't know, because, because if, we, if we, I think this happened with a lot of our songs. They are beautiful, it happened with Louis Riel. They are beautiful, beautiful songs that, um, that became um, separate from the protocols governing how they can be used and the, the um, spiritual effect that they can have, negative spiritual effect that they can have when they're sung out of context. And so... I think this has happened in many cases with mm -hmm. composers. I think, I think that they have been used because they are so beautiful and they seemed free to use. Uh, but there's been very negative consequences because of that, and no one knew. No, I mean, composers didn't didn't use these songs out of any malice or ill intent. They used them because they found them beautiful. But the fact was that they were um, separated from that context of how, of, of being sacred, mm -hmm. right? And so, you know, I agree with you on the one hand, but I, if I, I could add one thing on yeah. that is, um, the job of the composer is really to get everyone on the same, on the same idea, if, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, like, I'm, I'm not any composer myself or anything, but, um, songs that are made are most songs are made for the individual i can't talk i can't speak for every nation and tribe but for me for the mohawk people most song is is made for the individual or if not a certain group such as uh, the woman's dance that i was speaking about uh, that that's for the woman and it also goes back to creation but knowing those songs and singing them yourself for it to be coming out of the the person and to have that same idea that the, the same good good thinking with the song it's it, it's almost transformative mm -hmm. and it really connects you to for me anyway it connects me to who I am um, I'm sure that there's many people who um, sorry if I use the, no, no, the word fine. the word half breed. Yeah, like, no, I'm sorry. I like that word. <laughs> <laughs> but there are a lot of people on the reservations that that uh, that feel like they can't they can't use that they can't like that that feeling is disconnected to them mm -hmm. because maybe their mother isn't sure. um, part of um, the like the lodge. the lodge or the 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 nation or the tribe yeah. um so a lot of times those people they feel disconnected and me this is just talking to me personally that i always encourage people to give to give it a shot mm -hmm. but if it's not coming from you personally and if you don't have that good way of thinking about it if you if you're not learning the reason we have behind this song and if you're not using it in the correct way, then yes, it shouldn't be sung and it shouldn't be shared. But if you come to us or anybody uh, wanting to learn the song because maybe maybe it will connect you to something, then that would be up to the person teaching. Mm -hmm. Sure. And what's interesting mm -hmm. too is that if 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 knowing uh, Western music forms, if, if, if somebody would say, oh, I'm just doing some extended voice here, you know, it would, it would not read, would it read as mm -hmm. the same thing, you know? Mm -hmm. Oh, I've just got some extended voice in this song, you know, in this part here. Would it read as throat singing? Or would it be the same sort of thing? It's, it's an interesting notion, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or in, in Cree, you'd say, or, or you'd say, Thaskut's throat singing you know like saying that's the only way i can describe it it's like throat singing and all of a sudden it's throat singing mm -hmm. you know so it's kind of an interesting mm -hmm. conundrum it is also interesting because the the way that it was responded to at least in the, in the you know what i've read and talked to people about is of of that sense that sense you're talking about of belonging 
right? And it's a very, I mean, a lot of the response I feel we have to the issues of appropriation is because it's almost as if this thing has been taken we, or, or almost lost because of colonization of residential schools and the potlatch ban. Um, you know, I'll just say for those of you that are aware, the potlatch ban, the section three of the Indian Act for many years from the 80s through to 1951 outlawed uh, people, uh, indigenous people from the Pacific Northwest from practicing potlatch, which included singing songs, pretty much every song and, and dances and telling our histories. <laughs> with the threat of imprisonment and um, and having our regalia taken from us. And on the plains, all ceremonies. Uh, yes, yeah, sun dances all, as all, well. Everything, all ceremonies were outlawed on the plains. Mm -hmm. And so with these, with these incredible, the, the, these histories of disenfranchisement of our culture, you know, sometimes we hold on very strongly to what we have, um, what we, what we have. Um, and for important reasons, mm -hmm. but uh, you know, in the case of, of 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 this instance, I feel like it was because uh, it we there's a different attachment to throat singing here mm -hmm. that it belongs to the community, uh, and and I feel that as well with with um, you know my community songs that if someone were to uh, say you know use something because they found it beautiful. But that uh, you know, they don't have necessarily this attachment. I would feel that same kind of um, anger. Mm -hmm. Well, and it's even in the same way that if 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 some of our songs, um, when and if they're notated, and then somebody tries to perform them, and I know this is a similar issue in some older um, forms of classical music, you know, unless you're really aware of you know what that appoggiatura mark is and how in that era it was sung that way. The same thing would happen for us if somebody notated our songs, you know, we might listen to them and go, it's not quite right, you know? <laughs> you, think, you know, no, no, they didn't quite get it, you know? Like they've missed, they've missed something in the interpretation of notating it where it becomes flat and the rhythm's just off and they didn't quite get the nice sort of, you know, color that's supposed to be there or, or maybe the kind of, you know, the resonators that are supposed mm -hmm. to be used. No, you got to sing it from here, you know, not from here, not from here, you know, so. It's interesting. Yes. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of that has to do with um, people thinking about seven generations ahead. What are they going to be? Mm -hmm. Because a lot of our songs are orally trend, um, um, transmitted. Yeah, transmitted. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, no, 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 no. <laughs> uh, uh, anyway, um, so for th for years and years, we've always we've never had. Uh, ways to record them. It was always we teach our young, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. we teach our grandchildren, we che teach our children, they teach their children. So each year or each generation, it's going to change just a tiny bit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that preserving aspect that we all have, it's going to kick in if it's not just how we like it. Because, so. but, but I also think because there's a care yes, around that. There's relationship yes. embedded within that. Mm -hmm. um, it's a one-to-one -one or within a small group mm -hmm. kind of situation within a family or community. And so it's, it has a different sense of, um, of life, of, of sort of, of sharing, of relationship. And I think also then, when when in in other models, to to not see that relationship there can be a very hurtful thing. Mm -hmm. It seems callous, or it yeah. seems um, slapdash, you know, just careless, right? So, so again, if we if we think about that model of transmission uh, and the orchestral model of transmission, how songs are or how music is learned and presented. Um, you know, there's some really deeply embedded epistemologies of how things are done that are not necessarily meeting. Uh, and it's always one of the central questions, I think, in involving Indigenous musicians in classical music performance. How are the Indigenous music musicians going to keep up with the orchestra? or fit in or be, you know, led in in what Vice way, <laughs> rather than reversing that and thinking necessarily, how will the orchestra be able to uh, orally learn this, this indigenous piece? I mean, we can flip these things mm -hmm. very easily mm -hmm. here and, and think about different, different models that present 
uh, important challenges. Yeah, and I think in the same way that uh, when you're talking about the, the transmission method of how you learn that, you're learning from an expert language speaker, you know. So when you, now we've got English mixed in with mm -hmm. everything, French mixed in with everything, you know, other languages, you know, the language starts to kind of like flatten out, you know, and if we don't have those experts who understand what those, those sounds are, you know, and where they're in the body, how they're embodied, you know, uh, that's the problem, you know, how, how is that going to continue to be transmitted, you know, and how are you going to teach non-Indigenous speakers to kind of understand that embodiment, because so much of the world view goes along with that embodiment, you know, mm -hmm. there's ways that you can remember. When I was learning your name, I was like, oh yeah, we have that sound in my language, mm -hmm. okay, good, I can, I can remember that, you know, so, but how do you do it if you, if you don't? I mean, the IPA only goes so far, eh? <laughs> <laughs> So, I believe, I believe um, this has been such a rich and generous um, exchange of gifts uh, in this conversation. I think you've uh, given us much and we are very grateful. I know that there are more questions that are boiling around this room. I've got a really hot one, but I think I'll save it for when your PhD is done, Cheryl. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll come back to you on this one. Yeah. Um, but I, I just, on behalf of everyone in the room, I want to thank you most deeply uh, for this extraordinary discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.